October 20th, 1868. A small group of ships enters Takanoki Bay near Hakodate. Thousands of well-armed men disembark, overwhelming local forces, and soon occupy the city's recently built star fortress, Goyokaku. These men are under the command of Enemoto Takeaki, an admiral of the Tokugawa shogunate's navy, which after the fall of Edo, refused to recognize the new imperial government. Rather, they fled north to Hokkaido, then more commonly known as Ezogashima, or simply Ezo. And it's here they intend to make a last stand, to preserve some vestige of the previous order, developing this remote territory on the fringe of Japan while safeguarding a way of life, the Tokugawa clan and its many retainers from a wave of modernization that admittedly had already started in the waning days of the shogunate, the so-called Bakumatsu. This is the story of a polity, more than a state really, which came to be known as the Republic of Ezo. And hey, if this sounds interesting to you, subscribe down below, click the bell for notifications so you never miss out on a future episode. And with that out of the way, let's get to it. Our story takes place on Hokkaido, Japan's largest and northernmost prefecture. Today, this is the land of Hatsune Miku, expensive watermelons, soup curry, seko mart, yuki matsuri, seafood, bears, Genghis Khan, grilled mutton, not the leader of the Mongol Empire, vertical traffic lights, milk-flavored ice cream, and melon kuma. However, for much of its history, Hokkaido was a very different place. During the Jomon period, it's generally believed that a people of Northeast Asian origin began to settle the lands around the Sea of Okutsk, including northern Japan, sometime in the 6th or 7th century AD. Known today as the Okutsk culture, these people were maritime hunter-gatherers, heavily dependent on the sea, and they likely interacted with other Jomon-era peoples already present in the area. Bear worship, a practice shared by the later Ainu and Nifik peoples, may have also originated with the Okuts culture. More on that in a bit. By the 12th century, the Okuts seemed to have merged with the Satsumon culture, a partially agrarian people who then lived in northern Honshu and southern Hokkaido. The byproduct of this merger, likely, and I have to say that because there's still a lot of uncertainty here, was the Ainu. And it was shortly after this, the Okuts disappeared from Hokkaido. Taking into account Ainu oral tradition, like the Yukar sagas, it seems the Okuts may have been defeated in war by the proto-Ainu Satsumon culture, and therefore retreated to Sahalin. This was followed by an invasion of southern Sahalin, which forced the Okuts and their eventual descendants, the Nifik, to the island's northern half. Spreading outward from Hokkaido and Sahalin, the Ainu soon migrated to the Kurils, Honshu, and even the Kamchatka Peninsula. Their actions on Sahalin, though, which included raids on the Nifik, eventually caught the attention of the Mongols, who made several incursions into the island between 1264 and 1308. A bit of an interesting side note here, but there are some historians who theorize the Mongols' interest in Sahalin wasn't merely to secure tribute and trade goods from that part of Northeast Asia, but rather it was part of a larger effort to find an alternative route for the invasion of Japan. From Sahalin, they could have theoretically sailed to Hokkaido and invaded Honshu from the north. There are, however, no historical records supporting these claims. And at that time, Sahalin's geographic proximity to Hokkaido wasn't known, so this probably was unlikely. But you never know. The Ainu soon made Hokkaido their own, settling in small villages called Kotan near the island's many rivers. Each community, under the leadership of a headman, who usually supervised religious ceremonies, had rights to fishing, hunting, and gathering in a specific area. Men sported beards, and women often were heavily tattooed, especially around the mouth. These were not merely decorations, though, as it was believed that this would keep evil spirits from entering a woman's body. On that note, in terms of religion, the Ainu practiced a type of animism, believing that everything in nature possessed a distinct spirit, or god, known as Kamui. And, of all religious practices, the bear ceremony, or Iomante, 
in which a bear cub, raised by the community for about one to two years, is killed, remains the most recognizable aspect of bear worship in Hokkaido, even today. Rather than a sacrifice, though, the ritualistic killing was seen by the Ainu as a way of returning the bear's spirit to the heavens, as gods come to earth only temporarily as animals or objects. It probably is no exaggeration to say that all of this would have been quite shocking to an outsider, and more and more from a new nation to the south were beginning to show up. By the late 12th century, the nation we know today as Japan had pretty much taken shape. It was the land of the Yamato people, or Wajin, the descendants of the indigenous Jomon and Yayoi people, who likely immigrated to the archipelago from the Korean peninsula sometime between 1000 and 800 BC. At least, that's the most commonly held theory. Just a quick note, I'll be using the terms Yamato and Wajin in their historical context going forward. It's a lot easier, you'll see. But you could just as easily insert Japanese instead, especially in later centuries. Anyway, the Yamato were not alone, and early in their history, they encountered a people they called the Amishi, literally shrimp barbarians in what is today the Tohoku region of northern Honshu. Now, the Emishi may have had some relation to the previously mentioned Satsumon culture, although a connection with the Ainu has also been suggested, among other theories. Regardless, these people, often described as quite hairy in contemporary accounts, either because they were literally hairy, wore furs, or maybe both, resisted Yamato expansion. Known for their horsemanship, archery, and hit-and-run tactics, the Amishi were nonetheless eventually conquered following the conclusion of the 38 Years' War in 811 AD and assimilated. Informal trade between the Ainu and Wajin almost certainly predates the 1400s, with early Japanese legends describing those who ventured north of the Sugaru Strait eventually reaching the shores of a somewhat mysterious land they called Ezo. By the mid-15th century, around 12 small fortified Wajin communities dotted the coastline of the island's southern Oshima Peninsula. Conflicts between the two groups did occur intermittently, often the result of trade disputes, but generally speaking, things were peaceful enough. That is, until 1456, when the first in a series of major confrontations between the Ainu and Wajin occurred. Known today as Koshamain's War, the conflict began over a dispute regarding the value of a sword, but likely stemmed from broader concern about increasing Wajin land ownership. It quickly spread, with Ainu forces under the leadership of Koshamain, for whom the war is named, destroying a number of Wajin forts before they themselves were overwhelmed. In the war's aftermath, the Kakizaki family received official recognition from the newly established Tokugawa shogunate, their domain becoming a part of Japan proper, and following a quick name change, the newly dubbed Matsumai would dominate Ezo for the next 200 years. The Oshima Peninsula was then divided between Wajinchi, Japanese controlled land, and Ezochi, that of the Ainu. In 1604, the shogun granted the Matsumai the right to prohibit Ainu trading, except at designated trading posts, meaning that all trade even in the so-called Ezochi, now went through the Matsumai, who often made take-it-or-leave-it offers. Further tensions arose when the Matsumai unilaterally changed the exchange rate of goods, and, in 1635, opened much of the coast, most notably the Kushiro area, to fishing. The discovery of gold in the early 1630s also resulted in a massive influx of Wajin, who established mining camps deep within the island's interior. This consolidation of control, which disrupted traditional Ainu life, along with growing concerns over the number of Wajin settlers, eventually resulted in yet another conflict in 1669. Originally stemming from a border dispute between two Ainu leaders, Shakushane's war quickly morphed into a general rebellion against Matsumai rule on Ezo. Shakushane, the 80-year-old giant of a man who led the Shibuchari tribe accused the Matsumai of aiding a rival of his, the Hei, and following their defeat, he launched an all-out assault on isolated mining camps, Matsumai trading forts, and merchant ships. 
Somewhere between 200 and 400 Wajin died in the ensuing chaos, and 19 ships were destroyed. With the promise of a land once again free of Matsumai control, Shakushin was able to rally other Ainu to his cause, assembling a coalition of 19 clans, which mustered a fighting force of around 3,000 men. Understanding the severity of the crisis then unfolding before them, the Matsumai informed the shogunate, which arranged for daimyo in northern Honshu to send reinforcements and supplies. Although not possessing any firearms, the Ainu became known for their use of aconite-tipped poison arrows during the war, which despite a fearsome reputation were not particularly effective, being unable to penetrate samurai armor or even the cotton wadded jackets worn by ordinary foot soldiers. So perhaps, it's not surprising that, despite some initial victories, the Ainu were soon crushed. Shakushin, along with three other leaders after having surrendered, was later killed by Matsumai soldiers. And the Shibuchari's fortress was then burned down. After this, the Wajin domain on Ezo expanded to include nearly all of the Oshima Peninsula. A strict policy of segregation was put in place, guards stationed along the border with Ezochi, and Ainu were prohibited from using metal or sharp-edged tools. Many tribes also soon found themselves forced into arrangements that benefited the Matsumai, which included making their people freely available for labor. This eventually formed the basis of a contract labor system known as Basho Ukeoi, in which the Ainu worked as seasonal laborers for Wajin-controlled fisheries, among other things. Herring, in particular, had become increasingly important as more and more Honshu farmers adopted the practice of fertilizing their fields with Ezo fish meal in the 18th century. It was also around this time the Matsumai Lord became an official daimyo, a retainer of the shogun. Increasingly marginalized on Ezo and forced onto unproductive lands, the Ainu soon had to abandon their traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle, which of course made them reliant upon the purchase of rice from Wajin traders. When factoring in the spread of new diseases like smallpox, previously not known among the Ainu, what followed wasn't really unexpected. Population declined. By 1800, there were only an estimated 20,000 Ainu compared to 30,000 Wajin, a far cry from the estimated 50,000 Ainu and 12,000 Wajin in 1600. Matsumai rule, however, came to a rather sudden end following another uprising in 1789, which convinced the shogunate it needed to play a more active role in the management of Ezo. This decision was also partially motivated by the appearance of Russian ships in the area who tried unsuccessfully to establish trading posts. Excuse me! I didn't do it! Oh! <laughs> Can I help you? Yeah, I'm ready to order. What do you have? I'll take a... Trading post. What did you say? I said I'll take a... Trading post. Huh? I heard his order, Mr. Krabs. He said he was... Trading post. What? And, uh... Port access. Trading post. Port access. Huh? Trading post. What? Trading post. In 1799, Edo imposed direct control on the eastern part of the island, and the following year began to aid settler groups. This saw about 130 farmer samurai and their families head north to the Kushiro area, each being supplied with a small amount of rice, silver, a horse, and a gun for every two men. They were by no means the last to do so, with perhaps as many as 60,000 people moving to Ezo under various government-sponsored settlement programs. Further incursions by the Russians around the Kurils and southern Sahalin then resulted in a call for the various domains of northern Honshu to assume responsibility for different sections of Ezo, along with the deployment of thousands of troops. Doing away with the Basho Ukeoi, the shogunate appointed Bugyo, or magistrate, worked to implement direct supervision over Ainu trade, an important means for the exchange of goods from outside Japan, as the country then still followed an isolationist foreign policy known as Sakoku. Officials also began reforestation and land reclamation efforts, along with infrastructure development, which saw the construction of roads, harbors, and organization of a basic postal system. 
In 1821, however, the Matsumai returned to Ezo. I'm back. This didn't last long though, and the shogunate once again took control of the island in 1854, thus bringing an end to the Matsumai era. This, however, is not the end of our story. The background of Hokkaido's history, or as it was then called, Ezo, is important for understanding the context of what was to occur next. Japan had made territorial claims, sure, but they were by no means unchallenged. Uprisings by the indigenous Ainu were not some forgotten, distant memory. And officials in Edo feared that Russia could make a move at any moment. This in many ways was still frontier territory for Japan. And rather interestingly, it would be here that the shogunate came to an end and a new era, literally, would begin for Japan. But that's something we'll talk about more next time. Until then, peace.